Well, uh, the bigger thing to me was this reaction Grant Morrison had to Elmore, which has carried through to... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Grant Morrison has kind of very ungenerously tried to say Watchmen and other things weren't really that hot shit. And I mean, I kind of agree with him. I think Watchmen is overplayed. Uh, I, d- <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Well, especially now that we have, uh, you know, absolute carnage, you can just uh-huh. ditch your watch. <laughs> well, a, a difference between you and me, definitely, and I don't know if it's generational, is I consider it very important what order things came in, mm-hmm. in terms of chronological history of like that Alan Moore came before Grant Morrison. And I give Alan Moore a lot of credit for the doors he opened up, like that's part. And I give uh, Frank Miller a lot of credit for the doors he opened up and the uh, and so on and so on. So when I read a comic book, I I am for better or worse, and maybe for worse sometimes, maybe I give things too much credit because I take their historical context into consideration. Because I've been reading for 48 years, <laughs> I read most of that in historical context. So I hit right. Alan Moore when he was and I hit him at, at in like 1981 in Miracle, the Miracle Man and V for Vendetta stuff in a British comic. Sorry, I'm you hit him and he didn't give you a hex. Right, I I hit his Sorry. work and it felt like I hit a wall or went through a wall. Suddenly, I'm in a different world of comics. So I know what he's going for. I'm comparing him. I mean, his greatness in part to me is due to the context in which he was first publishing. And he was a quantum leap ahead of everybody from early on, not just with Watchmen, far be, far before Watchmen. Well, so I feel like some of what I'm saying here is, so there's a mix. So I genuinely do think Watchmen is overplayed and over hyped and all that um i also don't necessarily think watchman is alamore's best work um okay. i also think alamore is an incredibly fascinating creator who's created a lot of things and you definitely should read watchman and v for vendetta and some of his dc highlights and some of his weird alternate work and tom strong and listen to at least one interview with the man because um he hits me very akin to uh and probably part of the reason why watchman is what it is uh to steve ditko um hmm. as this That's somewhat reclusive uh person very committed to the art and like taking things very seriously in a way that most people would dismiss and there's something generative in that right um and also taking certain philosophies that people attribute a number of things to in ditko's case um objectivism in moore's case satanism or <laughs> not a satanism occultism yeah occultism. sorry but well um, he talks a lot about occultism but do you see that in most of his best comics i don't really notice it it's all over um it's all over a some of his work and not others it's but in promethea a lot i think but i don't I can't think and of same else. for dicko dicko played with a lot of occult stuff a lot of the time oh, really? but people don't think of him that way despite the fact that one of his biggest creations dr strange was steeped in it um which That's is also true. kind of fascinating when you consider the political leanings as well uh well, I mean, I think when he did Doctor Strange, first of all, he was working in comics. Second of all, it was to some degree a co-creation with Stan Lee. Stan Lee may have said, let's do a magic character. Steve, here's your assignment. And then Steve may have filled in the blanks and made Doctor Strange what he was. But Well, but beyond a lot of other things, what was in Doctor Strange was true occult reference and movements and like the symbols the hand gestures there's something there Mm -hmm. though interestingly those hand gestures and what were actually part of what um certain older um metal like heavy metal artists attributed to where they got the horns for they attributed that to dr strange yeah i I I need to I need to find this clip because I've brought this up a number of times and nobody uh, believes me, but, um, Ro- I've seen Ronnie it's James so- Dio claim to be the originator of the devil horns. And I don't know if that's really true anyway, but he says it's an old Italian curse. That is true as well. And I think all of them are true and different <laughs> people took to it in different ways, but, um, I, I don't know. It's just, there's so much fascinating stuff. I guess the reason why I buck at Watchmen or this idea of Alan Moore being first, making it more important or whatever is because I read this stuff and I read it and I enjoy it, but then I get to other works and I find them as exciting, as interesting, if not better in some ways. And in sometimes it's reaction and growth to, or kind of informed 
some of these other works and like when Watchmen's going on it gets all this credit for being dark grim and gritty but then how then how many people t- do they talk about the longbow hunters or something which was in that era and was that or then talk about the question comic that okay. was our complete reaction to Watchmen and can, can I respond to that for a second oh please do <laughs> so um yeah, maybe he's overcredited with certain things, but that still doesn't mean he isn't the best writer. So the hype might be wrong. Like, I agree with you that, like, there were a lot of things that you see in Watchmen that were already beginning to happen. Like, 80s comics were growing up, and mm-hmm. and Alan Moore was the most talented of that era, mm-hmm. but other people were, like, Mike Grell is a talented guy, but I don't think his talent is at the level of Alan Moore, but maybe crediting everything to Alan Moore is, or to Alan Moore and Frank Miller, which is the way people do it, is is probably wrong. But that doesn't mean he wasn't the best of that stuff. And what he wants credit for, and what I think he deserves credit for, is bringing in all kinds of narrative techniques that are now standard for a lot of writers, but were not standard. In fact, were not even thought of by anybody before he did a lot of those things. The narrative, te- which ones? Well, uh, like an easy example is in Watchmen, where um, you have a panel showing pirates, but you yeah. have have captions talking about what's going on in another panel. So that overlapping technique to my knowledge, did not really exist or did not exist in people's consciousness before Alan Moore. So there's lots of stand now standard things that came in because of Alan Moore. But that narrative, that narrative conceit has been around since Nemo and Dreamland. No. Yeah. I'm going to have to go back and read some Nemo and Dreamland. I don't remember any. Well, I- I mean, uh, it's maybe not quite going the on. same level or anything, but the idea of the kid talking about something that relates to the real world when, when he's in the dream and whatnot, you know, like, it's not a far reach, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, I I stick by my argument there. I'll I'll look back at because I have some Little Nemo. Um, And Little Nemo certainly is a very influential comic, apparently a major influence on Mobius, um, which makes a lot of sense to me all of a sudden. The vampire? Mobius stuff. No, not Morbius. (laughs) (laughs) Mobius, the French... Vampire. The the flaky French... Brilliant artist, <laughs> right? Artist and writer. 